Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And uh, again, just a, a quick uh, start. We'll just take a maximum of a minute each to uh, tell us about yourselves and about your organizations. Uh, obviously, some of you are kind of household names, perhaps some of you aren't. So uh, why don't we uh, uh, start uh, with, uh, uh, why don't we start over here? Thank you, Elliot. Um, so Ramin from uh, Finleap. Finleap is a fintech ecosystem. We built own fintech companies in the field of banking, insurance, and asset management. Have built a little bit more than 15 companies over the last five years. Companies like Solaris Bank, Panther, Element, I think you saw them over the course of the two days. And um, yeah, looking forward to reshape finance with you all together. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, my name is Lisa Fraser. I'm head of innovation at Wells Fargo. Uh, Wells Fargo is a big bank, uh, US based, probably uh, 1.9 trillion in assets. 70 million customers, 260,000 employees. Okay, Mark. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Mark Bloom. I'm the uh, C CIO for Aegon, the large Dutch insurance company headquartered out of the Netherlands. Uh, we've got about 30 million customers globally, about 25,000 employees, about 20 countries. Our largest installation you may know is Transamerica in the, in the U.S. And uh, Arnaud. I am Arnaud Kdou, Deputy CEO for BPI France. We are very active in France, being a bank, extending loans to, to French companies up to 45 billion euros and investing in equity in, uh, in French VC funds and globally directly as a shareholder in French companies. We have around 25 billion euros of money invested in, in French companies. Strong focus on innovation. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'm going to start with a nice easy question. Uh, and uh, the question is simply, what is innovation? And uh, Lisa, since you have, you're the only person on the panel that has that word in their title, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Uh, head of innovation. So, innovation, uh, I'll start with what it isn't, and it isn't shiny toys. So, um, it really is about an obsession to solve a customer problem. It is about having a strategic point of view of the future um, and a point of view on the solution it is about executing relentlessly. Like you have to be able to execute and get things to commercialization. Uh, and it really is about celebrating success, but equally celebrating failure, because if you're not failing, you aren't innovating. And I think it is uh, more and more, but for us definitely so, it's about partnerships. And doesn't matter what organization you're from, and for us it could be multiple organizations coming together, it is about one team, one dream. Mark? Uh, so we, we, actually we have a agreed upon definition across <laughs> our management team, which is a feat unto itself. Uh, we have a, a, our agreed upon uh, definition is a, 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 um, a, a new viable business offering. Uh, and from there, then we extend that into this construct that I think many of us know called core, uh, adjacent, and transformational. And then that set, then sets the stage across our businesses for how we think about our focus, prioritization, funding, et cetera. And so that's our overall framework for how we do innovation. Then we track, monitor projects through investments and other things, as Lisa was talking about, along those same lines to ensure that we have a good distributed mix of initiatives through, again, the core, the adjacency, and the transformational. I was wondering how, how many meetings it took to agree upon that uh, definition of innovation. I, I, <laughs> I honestly, I lost count. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> well, we don't really have a definition of innovation, but for sure it's about making your customer life easier and also making your own life as an employee easier. So it's about fostering initiative within the company, about fostering openness, about recognizing failure, for sure. Uh, again, it's about the dynamic and the culture of your company. I mean, you're, you don't declare yourself as innovative. You become innovative because you encourage people to innovate, to think about what they're doing in a different way. So it's very bottom-up. It's a lot of discipline, meaning it's a lot of focus, a lot of recognition of failure, and a lot of frugality, which is something sometimes we lose. You know, you, you need to pull people, to, people under constraint to have them innovate. So you, you need to give the energy and you, give, you need to give a set of constraints which is going to, to ignite, if I may say, innovation within the company. Okay. Can, I, can I just add one more thing to what I had said before, is that it's also more than just about tech. Right? So we think, when we think about innovation, we think about tech, it's as much about the underlying business model 
as it is the tech model. And so actually, the business model actually tends to get more monetization value externally than actually a lot of the tech models. So as you think about it, it's both the, the, com the, the tech piece, but also the underlying business model. Remy? Um, innovation is the fundamental competence for future growth. Okay, uh, rather short. How, how many meetings does that take to, no, just, just okay. So, um, I mean, you, you've talked about what you, what, how you perceive innovation. Uh, is it, its ultimate purpose is, is what exactly for your organizations? It's, it's for growth, it's for, you know, shareholders, it's for employees, it's what, what's, is it just for customers? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the objective here? Growth is, the, the whole company involves every stakeholder personal growth of the talents, growth for the shareholders, of course, but without customer happiness and customer growth, you, you will not have happy shareholders. Um, so it's all interlinked. Um, yeah, I think it's future growth because if you stand still and thinking you have won the race, then you end up like the famous examples of Nokia and so on. And um, I actually read today, I don't know if you saw it, that eBay for the first time uh, eBay Marketplace uh, lost 5% in revenues. Who would have thought so? Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, Lisa, what's, what's the point of innovation for you? What's the main reason for doing it? Well, I think it's relevance, right? To As you look over time, you'll see many companies come and go. Um, not necessarily evolve and iterate and adopt change adopt for different customer experiences or demands, different business models, uh, didn't see technology curves coming. And so the point of innovation is about remaining relevant so that your business is viable uh, for the future. Uh, and for us, that's banking services. It's not about being a bank. It's really about meeting customers where they want or need banking services. And so we have to be relevant whether it's on us or off us. And that's why relevance to me is the point of innovation. Now, for it to be viable, we need an economic outcome. So it's not just for the sake of being happy, friendly customers. There has to be an economic outcome because you know banking systems are so important to economies because we fuel the economy by lending money. And that's material to all of us. Mark? Um, I think it's a matter of survival, to be honest with you. It's this old adage of eat or be eaten. Um, because it, the, the world has just become so hyper-competitive. <coughs> Customers now have so many choices in what it is they do, that if you don't create that constant differentiation in your proposition, then you run a risk. Right? And so again, it's what have you done for me lately? And you need some form of innovation to continue to create that ideation, that connection with the customer, that, that connection that really creates that affinity between them and you. So what have you done lately? I'll come to you, Arno, in just a second. Um, so what's, what's at, most recent kind of you know, innovation you can... Uh, yeah, so a, a, as an example, we've, we, we've worked with a, a Swedish company, know, some of you may have heard it, known as Benefy. It does uh, benefit solutions in the, in the, for workplace uh, customers. And, and so again, us as an insurance and a pension company, we now work with people like workplace benefits providers to now provide a much more holistic solution for a workplace customer and therefore for the, all the constituents in that. Again, we hadn't worked in that space before. A very natural partnership, very complimentary to what they do in uh, workplace and benefits, what we do in the savings uh, investments. Uh, and so therefore, by bringing those two together, we've created a different model and a different pro proposition for workplace customers. Arnaud, uh, the point of innovation for you? Um, I, I'd stay also staying alive in the sense that if you want to stay alive as a company, you need to adapt to your customers for sure. It's also staying alive in more of the sense of the BG's song, if you mean, you know, it's, it's about your company and your employees being happy to come to, to work in the morning and knowing they are changing things. If you stop innovating, then you have people coming to work in the morning saying, okay, I'm going to do the same thing I was doing yesterday. That doesn't work for any company. So if you want your company just to be dynamic and thriving, you need to innovate. If you don't innovate, you die. So I guess both for existing employees, of course, and also attract new talent. You know, no one wants to come and work for a, an organization that's kind of stuck in the past, right? 
Sorry, I didn't get you. So I was saying it's not just for existing em employees, so that they feel that they're you know part of something interesting and and yeah, the work is evolving. It's to attract new talent. It, it, obviously, it's both of them, and, and attract, attracting talents is more and more uh, difficult and, and key uh, in the tech industry for sure. So you need to give the right project, the right vision to the people you want to hire. But it's the same thing for for the people you have hired. You want to keep them if they are the good people. And you want to have a company made of people who enjoy what they do. And if you want people to enjoy what they do, you need to be open. You need to be part of the ecosystem, and you need to look for the next thing. And uh, Mark just told us kind of one of his uh, like the most recent innovation there. Well, what's the most recent innovation that you've uh, introduced at your organization? Metrics of innovation, or last example, sorry. Like uh, any oh. whatever that falls in within your definition of innovation that uh, that you've kind of introduced. For for us, it's it's a lot of new services. Our customer, we, we are very focused on SMEs and startups in France. So it's a very small set of customers. So for us, innovation is bringing to them new products uh, and developing new business lines. So for instance. You don't always do very uh, innovative things, but you do new things as a company. We are going to launch a, a retail VC fund uh, in two months, which is new, uh, I guess, to me in Europe, You know, giving access to any retail customer to really venture capital. It's a lot of uh, specific difficulty, and this is new. This will be available online for anyone in two months. Okay. New way to do venture capital. And uh, Ramin, your most uh, recent uh, innovation, I guess, we're trying to... Be innovative in everything that you do, but uh, give, give us an example of something that you've done recently. <laughs> Got out of bed in the morning and... I'm out. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have a think about that maybe. Uh, Lisa, what, what's uh, a recent innovation? Yeah, that, um, I'll give um, one consumer and one commercial. So uh, we have in Pilot right now what we call Greenhouse, which is a mobile bank for consumers. Um, and it's moved completely away from the transaction to the behavioral uh, banking. So helping customers put money away, set it aside in digital envelopes to pay the rent, uh, pay the internet bill, et cetera. So making it very transparent, the mental math uh, people are doing. Um, and then also um, this year, we announced last year, Wells Fargo Digital Cash, uh, where we will be uh, creating an internal use case for the use of distributed ledger technology for our internal money movement across countries. Okay. Uh, and I mean, obviously, uh, well, I'll come to you with a slightly different question, Ramin. Uh, so, you know, do you, do you get a sense that as a, as a startup, quote unquote, uh, that, you know, it, it's kind of already in the DNA from the beginning? It's like you're born with kind of innovation at the heart of, of what you do. Uh, what you do, you haven't got kind of legacy systems, you haven't got bureaucracy to deal with. Perhaps at the beginning, you haven't got as much regulation uh, to deal with. So in that sense, do you feel that kind of as a, as a FinTech that you're kind of uh, having a bit of an, uh, an advantage in going up against maybe established players who have all of those things that they have to kind of change uh, in order to kind of become more innovative? Sure. I mean, that, that is why we were able to build 15 firms and, by the way, get that four licenses. Um, but this is also what I'm most afraid of, that we're, that we're losing the speed. Um, and that's why I'm a big believer, not in one big corporate, I'm a believer in a decentralized ecosystem of lots of different assets. And this doesn't mean that the one of these assets can be large or big, and the other one can be small, but decentralized for yeah consistent growth because um, speed matters more and more technology is available everywhere and um, the reason why I then had an answer of innovation as I said it's a fundamental competence it's not just the one thing you do um, but clearly it's innovative that today you can basically lease a bank so when you when you want to build a bank today you can come to us and you just pay per customer you get the full thing but you don't need to get all the stuff. You can get it for the data, you can get it for transactions, you can get it for whatever you want. The same on insurance or wealth management. And is it innovative? Yes. But in the end, it's fundamental competences to, and what we find innovative for all of us together, but this, again, the industry can just do together, is how you connect this ecosystem in the best way, that it's way more stable than single assets provider to not run in the next crisis uh, and having a strong European financial ecosystem. Mark, you talked about partnering with a, a fintech as being uh, one innovation. I guess it's all great if you know the people at the top, um, uh, you know, who are defining what innovation is, uh, are kind of on board. But but how do you kind of filter that down to uh, you know a large 
you know, geographically diverse um, organization that's been around and has been doing things in a certain way for a long time. Uh, how do you get everybody on board and kind of, if you like, uh, change the DNA to, to make it kind of, you know, innovation first? So, so it's, it's not easy. So if there's anybody out there in the audience that does it particularly well, I'll, I'll take hints from them. Uh, but I will tell you what we, what we have done is, is we, as part of the definition of innovation I talked about before, we actually put together a 12-lever framework. Uh, and it starts with what is the ambition level of a, uh, at the top? So do we want to be tra more transformational, more adjacency, et cetera, as I talked about. From there, then the rest of the pieces start falling into place. It defines funding. It defines prioritization. It defines resourcing. And so it is very important you begin to push that consistent frame down. And, that, and as consistent as we can do that through the organization, that really, really helps us. So that, that enables much better implementation of, of that uh, along the continuum. It's, I mean, it, it sounded a lot cleaner than it really is, it's really, really, really difficult. But at least it gives a framework by, by which people can operate off of. The, 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 the other thing that I find, I learned, uh, has been really challenging working, particularly with fintechs like the people up on stage, is when you're dealing with companies like Lisa's and mine, right? It, we have a lot of bureaucracy in our companies. The overhead is, can be difficult. And so the contracting vehicle of getting some of these fintechs on board with us quickly can be really, really challenging. And, and so I think, uh, and I don't want to speak for Lisa, she can obviously answer it herself. I know we've made progress there. I wouldn't say we are good at it yet, but much more progress at being able to engage contractually with these fintechs in a much easier fashion, whether it's proofs of the concepts or, or pilots. And again, that helps also with the DNA through the organization, which is why I bring that up. I don't know. don't really have, a, again, a framework. I, I think we are putting a lot of caution in, into being sure that it is across the company. So first of all, being sure that we don't have an innovation department on the side. You know, we, we see this a lot in, in, in a lot of corporates still, which is a bit dangerous because you have the new ones and the old ones. That doesn't work this way. So we have a network of people which are uh, linked to our chief digital officer, we, but who are uh, hierarchically linked to the business managers across the business lines. And these guys, are, these guys are there just to make sure that uh, there is a flow of innovation within each business line and that things can happen after that. So things happening means a lot of technology, a lot of networking with, um, with fintechs. Uh, that's part of the job. A and then it's about aligning, as you mentioned, all the, uh, you know, we call it the Bermuda Triangle, but you have compliance, you have legal, you have technology. All those things that can make any good idea flow across the line uh, sooner or later. So, so we have a team trying to align these people, but then the, the key innovative people are part of the business lines and each manager is incentivized on, on his innovation. Lisa? I just um, want to paint a little bit of a different picture. Um, I joined Wells Fargo 18 months ago from the fintech startup space in San Francisco. Before that, I was in a big, ba big bank in Australia, and before that, I founded my own startup. So startup, big bank, startup, big bank. So I can talk both languages. Um, and what I find is all the processes that are required for regulatory companies like ours are the same pretty much everywhere. So like the processes of FinTech or any startup have to be part of our ecosystem and, and be a, a customer or supplier of ours. Everybody's gonna go through the same thing roughly because it's largely regulatory driven. The, what I like is about the two together is the following. When um, the passion and single mission focus of a startup, the energy, the agility, the lower cost tech and the ability to move, right, is very exciting, right? And there is an energy and passion about it. It literally is not impossible is the theme. Um, but there's a lot of naivety. Right? And so on the big company side, what you bring, if you bring the right people with the right mindset, like the folks that we're representing, our teams that we represent up here, you end up with this amazing marriage, right? Because you're bringing deep expertise on subject matter, with subject matter experts the startups don't have access to. With the Wells Fargo Startup Accelerator that we run, we also do full technology evaluations of the startup so that they understand what it means to be financial services, scalable, ready technology. 
And so this partnership is not possible separate because we as well Fargo wouldn't get access to that early solution, that energy, but the, the ide ideation of pivoting on a problem. And that startup will take longer without our partnership. So yes, there's bureaucracy and things like that, but net net, the feedback we get, because we try to accelerate it just like Mark is saying, the value we create together is more than the two apart. Yeah, the, the, so we, we talk a lot about corporate, how you can innovate, and then you talk about corporations and so on. And I think the word corporation or partnership, you need to be very, very careful with it because sometimes it's too overused. If it's real co-development, like Lisa says, where both benefit, and like, like I really mean both, and it's on eye level, then great. Um, and I believe that what, what Lisa says, that it's happening at Wells Fargo. In Europe, I have seen it 95% the other way around. It's not a real partnership. It's not a real corporation. It's a startup with the limited resources trying to run against the big guys and dying in death of governance. So what, what, we, what we suggest mainly is, and basically the word governance is something you need to learn when you come from the startup world. You, you don't know, right? Uh, when you work with banks, it's a fundamental word to know and to manage. And I think you, banks and financial institutions, because they have the power, because they have the scale, because they have the resources, they do good if they implement solutions which are ready. So I'm not a big fan of POCs actually from a bank side. You can do POCs with small fintechs and a small niche, but if you implement it, you need to go the full way, my belief. If you want to do something on your own, I would really try as a corporate to capsule it. So we now, right now, we're building a challenger bank for a bank. Um, so you can, it's clearly corporate innovation. You can call it a hatch, whatever. But we say them, give us the money for two years. You can come twice a year to look. But if either we deliver in the two years, you have a, and there's, was, there's just two KPIs. The one is the customer NPS, and the other one is the customer number. Okay, guess which number is higher? <laughs> like more important, the customer NPS, right? Because the number is not so necessary for the corporate, you have customers. Um, so when it comes to corporate innovation, I think that we waste a lot of things because we want to do everything at the same time. And uh, we want to have good scale, good governance, good compliance, good POC, good talent. We want to have digital transformation of our talent. I find it super difficult, and I have not seen it successfully being implemented in Europe, at least. Again, Wells Fargo, we don't have a Wells Fargo in Germany. <laughs> we don't have a Wells Fargo probably in Europe. It's maybe different, like, but in Europe, I, I think so, I see it's so struggling. Mark, Mark and Arno, are you kind of uh, aware of these uh, uh, you know, criticisms of uh, European financial institutions and the way they uh, interact with fintechs and kind of you know, maybe take baby steps with POCs instead of kind of just you know, jumping in and, 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 you know, seeing if it works? That, that, <laughs> that's a true statement. So, so um, but, but I, I think we're getting better at it. So, 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 you know, we measure the range of various fintechs we work with. Um, we have, uh, um, internally, we've worked a lot on our underlying technology architectures to enable the fintechs, because that's one of the big inhibitors, right? Our, our, when you are, come from the world of heavy legacy, Right, a large part of our technology architectures don't adapt well to be able to interact with the fintech. So we've all worked hard on our architectures to enable much more of that. Um, and and honestly, in, in our case, the, the fintechs that we've worked with, we will go with that fintech to the regulatory body to talk about that, right? Rather than just put them out there on their own, we'll go we'll go together. So I, I actually see much more of a of a positive trend of working with the fintech. So I I don't see. Uh, the, my experience on both sides of the pond, both relative to U.S. and Europe, I, I don't see a big difference uh, in the interactions with the U.S. community and fintechs versus the Europeans and fintechs. But you said you're getting better. Like, what, what's holding you back from from you know going the whole way? Uh, I mean, if what, what, what's holding you back? Why can't you and you know the rest well, of your? I, I, again, I, I reference our technology architecture. Yeah. So I've got in my environment, I have over 3,000 applications. Right, to get those to work with these gentlemen's systems. Right, they all work off of APIs, they all work of a common data lake sort of services. 
right? I've got to get my systems to work much, much more compatible with that. Otherwise, we spend an enormous amount of time engineering these solutions, and they, <laughs> they lose interest in us or the other way around. And Arnaud, you're, you're also familiar with these kind of uh, yeah. uh, concerns? Now, obviously, it's been a big pitfall uh, in Europe, at least, uh, and I guess uh, around the world, and not only uh, in the banking industry or the financial industry everywhere, but it's, uh, it's stronger maybe in the, in the financial industry, but basically we are getting away from it because people are improving both in terms of culture. A large part of it was, was due to uh, what, what you mentioned, which is you know, the ability to speak both languages was in itself at the beginning the main pitfall. The ability to have the right technology, I, I guess it took like five years for banks to understand how they, they should you know, have their own IT systems evolving to make it easier. Uh, the ability to have focus, the financial side of it also meaning uh, what kind of partnerships can I structure, how can I invest, not invest, the value of a POC, which has a value, uh, uh, was not understood in the past, so you had a lot of banks you know, asking startups to spend three, five, six months on a POC for nothing, with just the perspective of maybe there will be a product, and you had on one side people believing there will be a product, and on the other side, People, people thinking, hey, that's great, I, I, you know, I'm outsourcing my innovation and let's see what's, what happens. So people are getting, again, more focused, uh, more value-driven, have a better understanding of what it takes in terms of technology. Uh, so it's getting better, for sure. It has to. Just one more point I wanted to add is that in Europe in particular, it's a very heterogeneic re regulatory environment. There's still a lot of... of lack of commonality across the rig. So as you try to take common capabilities into those marketplaces, you've got to deal with some regulatory differences. So that's one of the other things we've encountered as we've tried to take common solutions into various marketplaces is that either the local attorneys or the local regulators need some nuance around, around that. Uh, Ramin, you kind of accept those uh kind of uh, challenges that, uh, that they face or, or the efforts being made by, I mean, obviously not representing the entire European financial system here. Right. I think what, what Mark said is, is very fair, right? He needs to be ready to work with certain parties. And if he is not, then the clear answer is, I'm, I'm not working. It's like, I met a big, very large insurance company. They said, come in two years again. I have transformation right now. I cannot, I cannot work with you. So this is one thing. And the second thing is, what uh, Anos was saying, this was what really was happening in the past, right? Let's do a POC, the startup is doing it for free because it's so cool to hang around with, like you're this little startup and suddenly you go in the boardroom of an Aegon and, or whoever and then you're impressed and, and, and then you do all this work and you put all your energy in it and then you come out with nothing and that destroyed a lot of value in the past, um, I believe. And the second thing is, I, I, just, I just wanted to raise the flag that this corporation partnership word is a dangerous word, right? If it's a client business relationship and the guys will pay for a POC, it's fine because then for the startup, it's a type of investment, but it's paid for and, and so on and so forth. Both sides benefit. Um, and on the other side, I think the FinTech gladly matured so much that you can actually have reliable suppliers even for the big companies. Um, but I agree that there was also and to Mark point, there were too many small feature startups. We had feature startups, I call them today. At the time there, I was super proud that this one startup had just one feature, it's excellent delivered, but it's just one feature. And to have a chief risk officer, CFO, or head of sales, et cetera, PP, for just one feature venture was not valuable enough. So what we did, we merged them all together to one 200 people plus organization and suddenly, the CTOs, like Mark say, good. I mean, you have all these baseline competencies you need to sell. But again, what I'm saying is then it's fine. We're a supplier, their customer, Greenfield, right? It's, it's a fair playing field, and if we lose, we win all together. But um, I think the partnership and cooperation with and corporate innovation is dangerous because people start, when the worst thing is, what I, I think what I see is CEO, CEOs counting corporation we have for startups. Oh, I have eight fintech corporations. Oh, I have 12 fintech corporations. This is not Lisa, partnership is uh, dangerous when you're in San Francisco, so you're kind of at the coalface, if you like, of uh, where innovation is kind of all around you. Um, do you uh, what, what do you make of, uh, of these uh, uh, criticisms of, uh, of the partnership model? And, and for you as Wells Fargo, do you, you know, is, 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 is kind of working with them uh, or working with fintechs or maybe just buying them or maybe just helping them as a, to have them as clients? Which is the, which is the kind of 
favoured route for you? Well, I think in business overall, it's an art and science to pick a partner. So it sounds like you've got a lot of scars. <laughs> Five years. <laughs> right? I mean, it's true, right? The experience you describe could happen anywhere, could happen at Wells Fargo as well. So one is actually really understand who's on the other side of the table. The, what we do in the Startup Accelerator is we invest. We invest up to a million dollars. So I don't think that's a free POC in my book, right? No. Oh. <laughs> Right, so, yeah, so I think there are many ways. Sometimes the companies are far more mature, right? So not early stage, Series C, Series D, got multiple cl uh, clients or customers. For them to spin a proof of concept up to show us in a sandbox what it is should not be a hard ask, right? Because that should convert quite quickly to a commercial, right, uh, opportunity. So. I know the word depends, you know, is horrible, but it does, like where you are in the company. Like we aren't expecting pre-Series A, Series A companies to do proof of concepts for us for free. We don't ask them. And if we aren't uh, ready for them, meaning we don't think it's the right time, uh, I think it's professional code to say, not right now. And that's what I do. And you can ask a number of startups upstairs on the second floor and they heard, just not right now. Because if I don't prioritise what I think we can get through, it's not a good use of my team's time, it's not a good use of the startup's time, and having had my own startup, the last thing I want to do is waste time with uh, an organisation as big as Wells Fargo that could take a long time. So I'd say pick your partners wisely. And uh, oh no, you, you talked about that, uh, you know, the startups and, and uh, investors kind of being you know, clients of yours. When you're uh, uh, dealing with them as well, do you kind of, you know, Lisa's talking about kind of the way that they have an accelerator, that they invest in these companies and that they, you know, to, to partner with them that way. Is that something that, uh, that you guys do? Do you prefer the kind of way that Mark was talking about earlier, where you're kind of uh, bringing in a, a startup to kind of help you kind of improve the way you do certain things? What's uh, your general approach? Our general approach is that... Uh different approaches for different purposes. So we can invest in some companies, but we will invest really as a venture capital investor, not really caring about do we have a partnership to build or not, just caring about the value of the company. If it rings a bell in terms of business for us, it's even better, but it's not the key criteria. Uh, then we are a strategic limited partner to the VC funds we really like in the fintech industry, and that's the way we get, you know, if, we, if you will, our fingers plugged into the ecosystem really uh, as soon and as early as possible. And we still think it's the best way to, 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 uh, to understand things globally, if you will. Uh, and then we can partner on a commercial basis, uh, which is the most usual case. But when we do it, we try to be fair and we try to, uh, to give publicity to these partnerships, you know, so that it can support and bring value to, to, uh, to the companies we, we partner with. Um, and we encourage French corporates to, to do these same kind of things. We are a bit cautious about buying startups. It can be good, but you really need to learn how to do it and how to integrate. Few people are able, few corporates are able to do it so far uh, in a nice way. It's a bit of the elephant and, and the mice, you know, you, 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 pretty, uh, you say, hey, what a pretty thing, and you step on it and it's crashed and, and it's a very... So, 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 a lot of value destruction, if you will, in the fact of seeing corporates buying startups, which has been killing uh, the French fintechs during the, the first wave. If you look at it, now it's better. But you go back five years ago at the first fintech forum, banks were buying a lot of companies very early. And for a while, the ecosystem was not so thriving because you know the companies were taken away too soon, if you will. Uh, and Mark, before this panel, we were talking about kind of, you know, internal, external innovation. I remember one time I had on a panel of mine, I think it was actually a French insurer, which shall remain nameless, uh, and uh, the person was bemoaning the fact that their organization spends so much more money buying startups or kind of investing externally in, uh, in innovation than internally, that the people internally think, well, you know, if you spend that money on us, then we could do all of these things in-house. So, you know, you should 
kind of rebalance things a little bit better. So, uh, Mark, I mean, well, you were talking about internal versus external innovation. You've already told us about one startup you're kind of working with. Well, obviously, you haven't bought them, but you're kind of working with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where, you know, how do you strike the right balance between investing your money on uh, external innovation and building up that innovation capabilities in-house? Well, you, you talked before about the kind of the top-down models. So, the, the top-down models really, I think, more encouraged towards a large part of the external capabilities. So I, like Lisa said, we also have venture funds and we invested, I think last year in 22 different companies to really address some top-down business problems. But, but there's a lot of business problems that our own people know about that don't make it to the top, right? And it's really, really hugely important to empower our people to, to, to give them the opportunity to be heard. They love the opportunity to Go, go identify a few problems that may not make it to the top, and it's really incumbent on us to give them those forums to do that. So whether it's a hackathon, or whether it's these ideation challenges using these ideation tools, uh, working with universities on projects to encourage relationships with universities and leverage student talent. These are some of the things we're doing internally to, to try to encourage much more of that innovation, uh, uh, internal innovation, and let the employees be heard and be empowered. And you're putting your money where your mouth is? We are. Okay. We are, yes. Yeah. So we've, we've actually done a, a, a decent amount of it. So a, as an example, uh, we ran a global hackathon uh, two years ago. Uh, I think we had 82 or so ideas come out of that global hackathon. And, and I can say that close to 10 of those have actually gone through the whole production pipeline to production, and for any of you that's ever run a hackathon, that's actually a pretty high hit rate. I've done it now in a few different locations, and maybe I didn't do it right previously, but my previous success rate wasn't nearly as high as that. So again, it's right, getting the right sponsorship, getting and they get back right back to this 12 lever model: the right sponsorship, the right funding, the right support to then pull that through to uh, to an implementation model. Okay, I mean. I very much believe in the subject matter experts, um, as, as, as Lisa said, you, you need and um, investing in the internal talent. Most of the time, I think the, the secret sauce is a little bit giving these internal talents and subject matter experts the right governance then to act. Um, again, governance to act and maybe also the freedom and the encouragement. And the more importantly, very often what happens, the okay, now you do this innovation project additional to your existing job. So um, that is <laughs> something what we see when it comes to internal talents in corporates that they don't get the time and the, the resources to to do it. And I, I just could encourage every every corporate to do so and to take the best guys. This is another problem you sometimes <laughs> Uh, probably not in your firms, but uh, in some other firms in Germany, you, they, they tend to not using the best talent for the corporate innovation projects, which where the power is, I, believe, I totally believe that the subject matter expertise inside is a lot higher than coming from outside. And you, Lisa, you, do you wanna, sorry, can I bring uh, Lisa in just so you share just, um, I think uh, a lot of that is about um, a symptom of the culture. Um, where uh, risk-averse organizations like banks, um, it's not encouraged to put yourself out there and take that sort of innovation type risk um, because um, the fear of failure is high. And so what, um, what's really important, and by no means I can anybody, I think, claim victory, is how do you celebrate failure uh, in the areas of innovation in large companies. Because if you can celebrate that, and I've tried various different things, uh, it shifts the mindset that it's okay. The closer you are to innovation or digital, the easier that becomes. The further away you from that, it's much harder to see a path where it's okay to go champion an idea, and if it didn't work, feel like it was still a success. Uh, we haven't got much time left, and I know it's a bit of a big topic to kind of come to with 30 seconds left on the clock, but I'm just wondering where climate kind of figures uh, in your kind of the way that you're approaching your business and perhaps any other innovations that you're thinking of uh, bringing to your customers or to your employees uh, in order to kind of, you know, uh, recognize uh, the challenges that society, that the planet kind of faces with uh, what's going on in, in terms of climate change. 
Our uh, most very, very brief answers. Please. Our most recent uh, startup company in the accelerator is the Climate Service. Uh, it's a company that does financial risk modeling on top of uh, climate change modeling to not only uh, understand the impact of climate on uh, real estate uh, portfolios, but also investment portfolios, um, thinking about how you, how you prepare to build affordable housing in the future in environments that are changing. Okay, uh, very, very quickly, Roman. We don't do crypto mining. Okay, very good. Mark, very, very briefly. No, no investments yet. It's at the management table, and we're starting to review portfolio companies. And Arno? And it's, it's basically at the core of all of what we do. So it's not risk management anymore. It's just something that is happening. So you, it's just part of business every day. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, a round of applause for uh, our panelists, Arnaud Caudot, Mark Bloom, uh, Ramin Nirumond, and Lisa Fraser. Thank you very much. <laughs>